Are you happy? I mean truly happy. And what does it mean to be happy? What makes somebody happy? How do we measure happiness? Well, in today's video, that's kind of what we're going to try and find out, is why are other countries happier than the United States? Why do they rank top of the list consistently, whereas the United States ranks 18th, 19th, 20th on the list consistently? Hello, everybody, and welcome back. My name is Nate, and in today's video, I want to try and find out why other countries, specifically the Nordic countries, are consistently happier than the United States. I found a video here I'm going to react to, and hopefully they can shed some light on the subject, and we can all find some answers on why the United States isn't always the happiest country. Let's just jump into the video. What makes me happy is... I think I was definitely born happy. And then life happens. I'm getting a bit emotional here. <laughs> I feel very happy. Very happy. I'm happier now than when I lived in New York. And I got paid probably twice as much in New York as I do here. Our happiness is kind of like quiet happiness, kind of a stillness. What does it take to be happy? The Nordic countries seem to have it all figured out. Finland and Denmark have consistently topped the United Nations' most prestigious index, the World Happiness Report, in all six areas of life satisfaction. How have they cracked the formula? And are the people there really the happiest? Okay, before we get too far into the video, I just want to make uh, one point. And happiness to everybody is going to be different. The definition of happiness is different for me than it is for you. You know, where I might find happiness in doing very little throughout the day, or just relaxing, or taking it easy. You might find happiness in being busy all the time, or, you know, always doing something always having something to do, somewhere to go. So I feel like it's extremely difficult to be able to judge happiness or to be able to measure happiness. And I think what they're getting at is uh, not just what makes you happy, but how your, your life is, if you understand what I'm saying. It, it's not just I have a house and a job and a wife and kids and a car and I'm happy, but where is life taking me? Am I happy with the journey that I'm on? Am I content with where I am in life? Uh, I feel like that's more of how they, they measure the happiness. Is Happiness is different for everybody, but is your life making you happy? Is where you are right now in your life um, making you happy. So let's continue and see what they have to say. The United Nations just named the happiest place on earth. It is not Disney World, it's Finland. In 2019, the World Happiness Report named Finland the happiest country in the world for the second year in a row. Denmark came in second place after claiming the top slot in 2013 and 2016. Year after year, Nordic countries like Norway, Iceland, and Sweden round out the top of the list. Enter Jeffrey Sachs, a professor at Columbia and the co-editor of the World Happiness Report. What do those countries have? They have a high level of prosperity to be sure, but they're not the richest countries in the world by any means. The idea is a good balance of life. You don't have to get super rich to be happy, they believe. In fact, if someone's super rich, they look, what's wrong with that person? Uh, so they're not societies that are aiming for all of the effort and time to becoming uh, gazillionaires. Uh, they're looking for a good balance of life, and the results are extremely positive. The annual happiness ranking began in 2012, but we can trace measuring happiness back to 1971, 
It came in the inspiration of the country of Bhutan, a country in the Himalayas that many people know for its innovation of attempting to measure gross national happiness. Globally, a standard for measuring success and productivity is gross national product. Bhutan had the bright idea of trying to measure happiness. Measuring happiness is a fairly complicated business. First of all, we need to understand what happiness means. It means the satisfaction with the way one's life is going. It's not primarily a measure of uh, whether one laughed or smiled yesterday, but how one feels about the course of one's life. Meet Mike Viking, happiness researcher and Pretty much what I just said. Uh, your the happiness is measured by your the course of your life, um, where you are in on life's path, uh, where you are in your journey of life, and not necessarily having the most money or the most material goods, right? And CEO of the Happiness Research Institute in Denmark. There's My wife has that book. Just a quick note: the Huga. A uh, very interesting book. It, 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 I'm not going to get into too much here, but it really goes into just um, being calm and enjoying what you have and just a simple lifestyle. I highly recommend. If I can find a link, I'll leave a link down in the description along with the original video uh, down below to that book. There's a lot of factors that impact happiness, everything from you know, biology to income levels to the city they live in. But I think that the best predictor we see in the data of whether people are happy or not is whether they're satisfied or happy with their relationships. So, so do we have somebody we can rely on in times of need? Do we have somebody we can share our, our hopes and worries with? These six categories help account for the differences in life satisfaction around the world. GDP per capita, healthy life expectancy, freedom to make life choices, social support, generosity, and absence of corruption. Take a look at this list here and tell me, uh, okay, so freedom to make life choices. I'm sorry, I thought the United States was the freest country in the world. Hmm, social support. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought social anything was the hand of the devil. Uh, absence of corruption. Yeah, no corruption um, here at all. And you wonder why the United States is ranked so low on the happiness report. Um, it's, I, I... On average, richer countries are happier. On average, richer people are happier. But once we get to a certain level of income, additional $100 a month is not going to impact how people feel about their lives. So with money, like with everything else, we see diminishing marginal return. And I don't know why. Meaning you get to a point where it, it, it just doesn't matter anymore. Like you said, an extra $100 a month isn't, doesn't matter at all. So you, you, you go up and then you just, you plateau because there, you know, more money isn't going to keep raising your happiness bar you've already reached that point. Why I'm bringing up this quote, because it's extremely corny, but there is a Kanye West song uh, in which he says that uh, having money is not everything, not having it is. And I do think that's true in the sense that when you don't have it, it's all you worry about. And when you do have money, you can actually worry about other stuff. Happiness also seems like this elusive thing. We have two words for happiness in Danish. So we have lykke, which is the elusive thing, the thing you experience once every blue moon. And then we have to be glad, like the word glad, which is different because it's more down to earth and you can be glad despite the fact that it's not anything special. It's no special day. Luke seems like this elusive thing that you can't quite chase. To be glad is more like our mindset. So I feel more like I choose to be glad at times rather than sort of trying to uh, chase happiness, because that seems like it's never going to happen that way. Really what that boils down to is just being content with what you have. Bring, I know this is going to sound cliche, but being grateful for what you have, right? If you're always chasing that elusive uh, happiness, 
dream, you're never content. You're never happy with where you are. And I feel like what he's saying is that if you find yourself in that point, just be glad in the moment. Live in the moment. Be present in the moment. Uh, be thankful in the moment. And you will be much happier if you're not always chasing that next dream, that next promotion, that next dollar bill, or that next material good. If you just sit, sit there and think, oh, you know, I am happy with what I have, then I think that makes your life much happier. Maria lives in Helsinki with her husband, Duke, and her two-year-old son, Luca. Uh huh. yeah, there it is. There it is, little monster. <laughs> Finland is the best place to have kids. When you go give birth, it's almost free. We stayed in the hospital three full days as a family. We had our own family room and we got like meals and support and help and everything. And the bill was about 300 euros in the end. It's basically like living in a hotel. In Finland, new mothers receive a free baby box jam-packed with 63 items to help with the baby's first year. You don't have to buy anything for the first two, three months. Of course, diapers and stuff like that, but basically. And also, you can actually uh, put your baby to sleep in that box. Our baby actually, Luca, slept in the box for the first month. Finland, along with the other Nordic countries, offers generous parental leave. Anu Partanen, author of The Nordic Theory of Everything, spent 10 years as a journalist in the U.S. before returning to her home country, Finland. She's also a mother. In Finland, you get 10 months of paid parental leave, out of which about four months is set aside for the mother and, and you start it before the baby is born, and then father can keep nine weeks. Typically, both parents stay home for the first three weeks. They share the rest of the time until the baby is nine months old. A parent can even stay home until the child is three years old and keep his or her job. However, the stipend is much smaller. Another determinant of well-being is one's... Could you imagine here in the United States giving birth, not only you're just paying $300 for three full days in a private family room, but then the hospital gives you a care package with 60 items for your baby so that you don't have to worry about for the next couple months getting clothes or you know a couple books it looked like obviously you need to uh, get the necessities diapers and things like that but and you wonder why they're they're happy they they these programs are there in place to make it easier for new moms and new dads to continue to keep their job for three years. Obviously, their pay goes down, but they aren't going to get fired. And you can share the time with the new baby and have that bonding experience. I feel like here in the United States, we are rushed back to work so fast that we're missing that bond between mother and baby and between father and baby because we're just forced back into the workplace. And then the kid is in, you know, childcare. And, I, and then you wonder why we have dysfunctional families. I'm not saying that's the only reason. Please do not misunderstand what I'm trying to say here. But I feel like that has something to do with it. There is not that tight bond between the baby and his or her parents. Sense of personal freedom to make important life choices. Can you shape your life the way you want? Christina was unhappy at her job in advertising and took an eight month break. Social security is also something I think it's very important. What I did didn't make me happy and it, it didn't let me have that work-life balance that we cherish so much here. And so we have a system that made it possible for me to quit my job and have some thinking time 
and figure out, you know, what's my next step in life. Christina received about $2,000 a month from the Danish government while she was unemployed. She is now in school to become a painter. Her tuition is covered, and she receives an educational stipend of about $1,000 a month. Two of the biggest perks of life in Denmark and... Oh my gosh. Uh, and people still ask me why I want to move to Europe. Not necessarily Denmark or Finland, but I feel like Germany is pretty close in a lot of their, their social systems. Um, maybe not quite on par, but similar. Uh, but imagine being able to say, you know what, I'm not happy with my career. I'm not happy with my job. I don't have a good work-life balance. I'm always working. As a matter of fact, today I've been working some. It's Sunday. It should be my day off, but I'm required to keep up and still not clock in, but be present and answer questions on my day off. Not a very good work-life balance whatsoever. And I'm frankly tired of it. But I could not in a million years just quit my job right now, take eight months off to think about it, figure out what I want to do, and get paid $2,000 a month. That's nearly what I make at a full-time job right now. Now, I don't know if they take taxes out of that $2,000. They didn't say. If you do know, please comment down below if that's a straight $2,000 or 2,000 euro stipend or if that's 2,000 euro gross and then taxes are removed from that. That would be interesting to know, uh, but I feel like it's 2,000 euro and that's what they're getting. I couldn't imagine getting $2,000 a month to rethink my life's course and then go to school tuition free and get a $1,000 a month stipend to do that, to pursue something I want to do. It just amazes me that people here in the United States are so blind to the fact that other countries, to me, that's freedom. That's freedom. They are free to say, you know what? This isn't for me. I'm not having a good time. I'm not happy. I'm going to quit. I'm going to think it through. I'm going to write a list. I'm going to do whatever. And I'm going to be okay. My bills are still going to be covered. That's freedom. What we have here is not freedom. If I quit now, we would lose the house. We would lose both cars because I we would lose half of our income with no help from any social system. I'm really starting to understand why they are so much happier. Finland are free education and free health care. Okay, before you all start, it's not free. We know that. Get over it. Stop commenting on, well, they pay higher taxes. We all know that. All right, just move on. If you got to comment that, go to the next video and comment something else. Income taxes are not at all as high in the Nordic countries that Americans tend to think. However, overall, it is completely true that the Nordic countries collect more taxes in general than the United States does. In Finland and the Nordic countries, there are higher taxes on consumption, like eating in restaurants and buying jeans. But the thing that I think a lot of Americans forget is that the Nordic people are happy to pay those taxes because they get services in return. Daycare, great public education, it includes your college, tuition free, it includes health care. All of those are included in your taxes. When the news we pay taxes, we pay lower taxes, but we don't get shit for those taxes. I'm sorry, we don't. I pay taxes on healthcare, yet I owe a copay and any other doctor bills that I go to. So why, why pay twice? They're paying much higher taxes. A lot of times it's not even that much higher depending on how you look at it. But then all of that's covered in there. So they pay once and they're covered. Makes sense. Hit that Finland is the happiest country in the world. I think most people kind of reacted to it like, what are they talking about? We don't think of ourselves as very happy because it's dark and gloomy in the winter and whatever. 
It's easier for Finns and Danes to shape their lives because the government supports so many of their basic needs. The American dream is probably more alive in Denmark. The perception of freedom is probably also a little bit different. It seems like in the US, the feeling is you have to be protected from the government and you have to have freedom from the government. I think in Denmark, the sense is that the government protects you. People trust other people. You leave a bag in a restaurant in Finland, you're pretty sure you're going to make it back and the money is still there. People even leave babies parked in strollers outside coffee shops while they run errands. And I think partly the Nordic society cultivates that trust simply by providing basic services for everyone. So there's much less poverty, much less feeling of injustice, inequality, crime. People get the education they need, they can have a job, they can work, they don't have to struggle in life as much. There isn't super wealth and there's absolutely no super poverty. Everybody participates. It turns out it leads to a wonderful kind of life and one that is expressed year after year as uh, making these countries the happiest countries in the world. Monica and Alex are expats who live in Copenhagen with their two teenagers. Alex is originally from the UK, and Monica is originally from New York. What else do you need? The olive oil, oil and the balsamic vinegar. Where's the olive uh, It's going to be interesting because finally somebody from the United States uh, living in one of these happy countries, I hope she explains kind of why she's more happy here, uh, maybe the differences. We originally came here expecting to stay only three years, but it was so good. I've been here nine now. It's also safe. And this comes back to the community and the trust. Uh, we can let our kids go out. And we do not have to sit here being really worried that are they going to come back? Are they safe where they're going? Do we have to go pick them up? We still worry, of course, but it's, it's just very different. There's still this very strong sense of family, friends, community. Balance is the formula for happiness. Aristotle had it right when he launched the study of happiness 2,300 years ago. According to Aristotle's golden mean, good behavior lies between two vices, excess and deficiency. People who pursue only money and say, I'll be happier the richer I am, turn out to be less happy. I do think having nice surroundings is a part of happiness, but I also... I think because they will never reach the end of that. You know what I mean? If, if all you are thinking about is more money, more money, more money, you're never going to have enough money. Like I said earlier, if you're consistently thinking about that elusive dream, that elusive thing called happiness, and you, you think that's more money, there's never an end. There's never, you will never have enough because you don't sit there and think what I have is enough. You're always chasing. So you will never be truly happy. I also think it needs to be linked with something that, that sort of resonates with you on a deeper level. Having nice surroundings and having a, a lot of money and being in a five-star hotel in Las Vegas doesn't make you happy at all. So I think it needs to have that balance. Cue the classic Nordic work-life balance. Rich Perusi, former New Yorker, has been living in Copenhagen for seven years. People stay pretty tight to a nine to five work day, but I do think that we get as much done in a, in a short period of time here as we, as we were doing in longer times working in New York. One of the comments we actually heard when we first came here was a Dane saying that when you see someone working late, are they doing it because they can't get their work done? Is there something, something wrong with them versus are they just trying to get ahead and, uh, and working? There, there is a, a sense that, yes, work's important and you need to get your work done to a high quality, but you also need to make sure it's balanced uh, appropriately. Sara Alhupuro is... Perfect, right there. Uh, why are they late? Is it because they're inefficient throughout the day and they can't get their work done on time? Or are they just trying to get ahead a little bit so that the next week uh, won't be so busy? Very good question to ask. Kind of takes me back to one of my previous videos on the four uh, day work week, where if you work fewer days and a strict nine to five schedule or whatever that may be, 
you're you tend to be more efficient and get the work done within that time frame. So instead of working five days and 10, 12, 14 hour days, uh, how efficient is that really? There's a lot of dead space in there. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you do. Um, you cannot honestly tell me that for 14 straight hours you are being productive. So I think that's a lot to do with this where they have that schedule. They know that that's the schedule and they are going to work that, that schedule, that time frame, be efficient, get things done, and then they have the time off. Is a diplomat and an artist who has shaped her work schedule to make time for her passion. So I actually need to go to my physical workplace only only three days a week. So then the rest of the time I can I can spend here in the middle of nature. When I walk in the forest, I walk there very quietly, paying attention to all the small details and all the colors very slowly and I try to spot all the small, small details and I completely lose the track of time. Usually I spend about five to six hours picking mushrooms. And that's what I was saying at the beginning of the video. That's bliss for some people. And some people that might not be any fun at all. So they aren't going to do it, but they're going to find something that pleases them and makes them happy. For me, to just, that is absolutely beautiful. The forest, um, just, I find myself doing that in Germany a lot when we go back to visit. And where my wife is from, she's surrounded by some forest, um, not nearly that dense, uh, but enough that I can take a hike back there and it's completely peaceful. I get the birds singing, a little wind through the tops of the trees. The smells are, are wonderful. It's fresh uh, and it's just, it's quiet and peaceful. And to me, that is happiness. Just to slow down and take it easy. And just another one quick point, my wife always comments every time we go back to Germany, about how we have so much time to do things, where if you if you were to make a list, her sister's big on lists and you know schedules, and my wife's always telling her, we don't have enough time in the day to do all this. How are we gonna accomplish all of these things? Yet they always do and have spare time. And it's just being mindful and being, um, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Being, being mindful of what you're doing, um, being efficient in what you're doing. You're not lollygagging here or there. You, you're going and you're getting these things from the store. You're going to go have coffee. Um, it's, it's just being in the present. I feel like that's, that's the key that many of us are missing here in the United States is that we're never just present. We're always chasing something. We're always in a hurry. We're always on our, our way to work or, you know, we have to grab a coffee and we have to eat takeout all the time because we're just always chasing something. We are never just there in the present. And I feel like that has a lot to do with being happy. People don't make as much money in the Nordic countries as they do in the U.S. So it's not really about how much you make. You don't have to make as much to get the same quality of life as you would. $45,284 average household disposable net income per capita. So that's not gross, that's net. That's what they're bringing home. And 29,000 for both Denmark and Finland. So almost $20,000 less a year. But I'm sorry. Money isn't everything. Yes, you do need money to live and survive, but you don't need to be a billionaire to be happy. In the United States. So if we look at the dimension called life satisfaction, we can see that, that money does matter for well-being and happiness, but 
I mean, on average, richer countries are happier. On average, richer people are happier. But the mechanism here is being without money is a cause of unhappiness. Not everyone likes to talk about money either. In Finland, it's been this kind of rule that you don't talk about money that much. At least like my parents basically wouldn't tell me how much they made, for example, if I would ask as a kid. It would be considered bragging if you would tell about how much you make, etc. People are happier when they are generous and when they feel that the society that they're in is a generous society. And then we find people want to live in places with decent government. If government is corrupt, if leaders are bizarre or autocratic or corrupt, the society is unhappy. In 2019, Finland elected the world's youngest serving prime minister, 34-year-old Sana Marin. That's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. I'm sorry, the United States is so jacked up with electing old ass men to run things. We are not there anymore. We don't need somebody in their 70s or 80s running for president. Let's get a 30 year old up there, somebody with progressive views, somebody who is, is living now, not somebody whose mind is still 50 years ago and that's the way they want to push things. I think this is absolutely brilliant. Danes are among the happiest people in the world, but they're not necessarily the friendliest. Lars A.P., author of Effing Flink and founder of the movement of the same name, wants to change that. So Effing Flink is a national movement. Our prime goal is to take Danes uh, that are among the happiest people in the world, but also being the friendliest people in the world. Why are we doing this? Well, because friendliness and positive human interaction means so much to us. Science shows us that. And so we're, we're trying to do that in all sectors and all realms that we can think of. Finland and Denmark both have populations of less than 6 million people. The U.S. has over 330 million people. The Nordic countries are pretty homogeneous, too. Do population size and diversity affect happiness? A lot of countries with relatively homogeneous population similarities among people ethnically or in terms of religion and so on are not very happy, so it's no guarantee. And on the other hand, it's possible to have a lot of diversity and more happiness. Uh, our northern neighbor in the United States, Canada, ranks higher. Yeah, I think that Finland is probably one of the most homogeneous countries in Europe. Still, we have recently had quite a lot of immigration, but I would say that still it is fairly homogeneous. I think it's funny because I kind of always, I guess, assumed that the Danish society was kind of diverse. But then we went to see Dave Chappelle's show here in, in Copenhagen. And both him and the guy who he had with him as support kind of opened their show saying Denmark is so white. And I never really thought about that before. But then ever since that show, I just think about it all the time. <laughs> We've been having immigration for hundreds of years from all over Europe. I mean, in, in the 70s, we had a lot of people from, from Turkey coming up, from, from Vietnam. Um, we had people from Yugoslavia in, in the 90s. And Denmark has remained uh, happy throughout that period. The 2018 World Happiness Report explores happiness among natives and immigrants. It shows that when immigrants are happy, the countries are too. But if the country is already happy, new immigrants will experience increased happiness. It shouldn't uh, undermine uh, happiness in the Nordic countries that there are influx of, of people born abroad. There's also a dark side to happiness. Like in Denmark, one of the biggest epidemics right now is stress and people being sick with stress and having to leave their jobs. And people outside of Denmark didn't really understand what that meant, like what do you mean stress leave, but 
it might be that expectation to have a work-life balance here that stresses people out that you both have to work but you also have to take care of your family you also have to be social with your friends you also have to you know do this self-realization thing hobbies and traveling and you, there's so much you have to do in the same amount of hours whereas maybe in New York or other places you know that you're gonna work to 10 every day so you don't expect to have the same balance you know yeah. It can be hard for outsiders to break into the Nordic cultures. That's very interesting. I never would have thought of it like that as as having that expectation to have a good work-life balance. And then if you aren't achieving that, that's adding additional stress to your life. Very, very interesting point. And I agree. I think if there's at any point an expectation of something or to do something or to be something and you you're falling short of that then that really weighs on you um, and can make you more unhappy or more stressful whereas if you were just that way and there was not that expectation uh culturally to be like that, then it wouldn't be as stressful. That, that I never even would have thought of the negative side of being happy to be the expectation of, hey, you need to take time off. Um, you know, that, that sort of thing. I, I, very good point there. The Danes have such tight-knit friend and family groups. It's not very natural for them to just include people, new people into their, into their groups. It is a little harder when you come in from the outside to um, sort of become part of that group. We've had some, some great uh, Danish friends, some met at work, but uh, it's, it is harder, I think, from the, on that side compared to the UK and the US in terms of developing friendships. I think that's true in Europe in general. Um, you hear a lot of people say that about the Germans as well as being um, cold and, and shut off and not very um, open and welcome to new people until they really get to know you or you get to know each other, then they, they start to open up. I feel like that's, that's not just Denmark and Finland. That's, that's kind of Europe, well, maybe not um, England, like you said, but uh, the continental Europe. You know, it might be like that in, in a lot of places there. There can be serious side effects to maintaining high levels of happiness. Within the States, if you look at the level of life satisfaction, the higher the life satisfaction, actually also the slightly higher the level of suicide rates. Uh, and the theory here is that it might be more difficult to be unhappy in an otherwise happy society because it creates a stronger contrast to how you are feeling if you are surrounded by, by very happy people. So Denmark actually used to have really high suicide rates. So in 1980, we had suicide rates of around 40 per 100,000, which was, um, I think, some of the highest in the world. Now, fortunately, it's around 25% of that, so it's around 10 per 100,000. South Korea and Lithuania have some of the highest suicide rates in the OECD as of 2017. So fortunately, suicide rates have been reduced a lot uh, in Denmark. Uh, also in, in, in Finland, there's also been a great reduction over the past few decades. But of, but still, it's not zero. Uh, so, so we still need to reduce that uh, even further. Despite mental health challenges, a big part of Finnish culture focuses on overall well-being. Sauna is a sacred thing for Finns. I have like so many good memories about having these sauna moments with my family. Sauna is something that I suppose you kind of have to like and love as a Finn. As of 2018, there were 5.5 million people living in Finland and around 2.3 million saunas. My grandmother always used to tell us kids that we can't fight in the sauna because we, then we would risk angering the sauna elf. <laughs> and there's even, even a sauna in the government of Finland where they say that they make some of the most important political compromises because you're culturally not allowed to fight in the sauna. Danes have mastered the art of comfort and coziness through hygge. I think the best short uh, definition of what hygge is is uh, the art of creating a nice atmosphere. 
And of course, that is something that happens everywhere. Uh, but what is uniquely Danish is we have a word that describes that situation. You can curl up in a couch and read a good book and have good music on and, and just be in a hygge which actually means a hygge corner of your room. There's a, a, a social component to hygge, which I think is really important. Hygge seeps everywhere throughout the country, from cozy drinks to warm lighting. So one concrete manifestation of hygge is the focus on lighting. The rule of thumb is the, the warmer the light, the more hyggely the light. So Danes love candles. So how does Hygge contribute to happiness? So happiness is both having a strong sense of purpose in life. It's also experiencing moments of pleasure on a daily basis. It's also feeling satisfied with life overall. So Hygge is this element in our daily lives where we experience comfort and, and, and pleasure and togetherness. And hopefully over time that accumulates also to a, a higher uh, sense of, of life satisfaction. Another way Denmark and Finland support their citizens? Paid annual vacation. So in yes. all Nordic countries, everybody has a right to paid annual vacation. It varies a little by country, but in Finland, for example, it's typically after you work uh, one year for the same employer, it's four weeks in the summer and one week in the winter, and everybody gets this. I actually heard a statistic. Four weeks in the summer, one week in the winter. That's five weeks after one year of employment with the same employer. I worked for an employer who didn't grant one hour of paid vacation until you worked three years at that company. And after one year, they get five weeks of paid vacation. It's something like when Americans go home after work uh, October 27th, you guys have worked as much as Danes will work uh, for the entire year. But I actually think that taking a little more time off also makes you a, a lot more productive. In Finland, it's traditional to spend the summer in a summer cottage, or mukki. We, we did have a summer house when I was little. It was uh, something that my, my grandfather built himself during the 60s, I think. And we used to go there like all the time when I was small. A week doesn't go past, past and during the summer when I'm not thinking like, oh, I wish we still had it. Traditionally, the Mekis wouldn't have necessarily electricity or, or running water. And usually most Mekis come with a lake or the Baltic Sea. You can go to, to your sauna and have a dip in the water. So in a Nordic country, the vacation time also serves families that if the parents stagger their vacations a bit, they can handle much easier the summer vacations for their children. And of course, then the family can spend time together. Well, maybe Finnish happiness is more like inside, you know, it's like an inner peace or something mm -hmm. like that, that it's not so open. And it's like a balance. It's more balanced, I think. So, ready. <laughs> Ultimately, Happiness is relative. If you think you're having more sex than your neighbor, then you're happier. We are social beings, we compare ourselves to each other. So there are social comparisons in salary, in terms of uh, the houses and how successful we believe we are, uh, but also in, in terms of sex. So what's one small way we can be happier today? For me, something that I've done which has made me happier is exercise. I think the saying no or being a tiny bit more selfish can make you happy. One step to improve your sense of happiness is go first. So you're walking down the street, someone else comes walking towards you. It might be just a smile. It might be just looking the other pe person in the, in the eye, whatever it is, but go first with that because you can't expect that the other person is going to do it. Don't be reactive, go first. In, in Denmark, we, we sometimes talk about the ABC for mental health, if you want to boost your mood. Three sort of universal tips is doing something active, doing something together with other people, and doing something meaningful. So gather a group of friends, go for a walk. That could be something that could boost uh, your mood. Predicting uh, the future on this is uh, very difficult, unfortunately. Where will the US be? It could be even worse than now, it could be much better than now. It's a matter of actually making 
choices for a better direction for the country and one that is not guided by fear and hate, but one that is guided by a sense of community and the common good. Well, that was a very interesting video. I really, really did enjoy that one. I hope you did as well. And one point on what the young lady said at the end, and that is to be a little bit selfish. Think of yourself first sometimes. You don't always have to agree to go out on a weekend or go out to dinner or go out to coffee. Learn how to say no sometimes. You are not put here to please anybody else. That is not your job. So if that isn't what you want to do, learn how to decline offers and think of yourself first. And I think you'll be much happier in the end. And this really comes down to something that I may or may not have talked about in a previous video. I know I've talked about it with friends and other people, but that is the idea of your emotions are yours, right? And nobody else and nothing else can change that. For example, if I'm driving to work and somebody cuts me off in traffic and I get angry, that person did not make me angry. I allowed myself to feel anger, to feel that emotion. And in turn, what that is ultimately doing is giving control of your emotions to somebody else. You're allowing them to influence the way you feel, where it was, it's none of their business. They do not have that power. So I tend to find myself in a situation like that and I stop and I think, you know what, you're not gonna dictate how I have a day, you know, what my day is going to look like. If I'm going to be mad the rest of the day, you don't have that power over me. So I'm going to let it go. That's no big deal. Go ahead and cut me off. I hope you make it to wherever you're going safely, but I'm going to make it safely and you can't control my emotions. You're allowing something else that you will never achieve to dictate and to influence the way you feel now. So I'm happy now. I am happy uh, with what I have. However, at the same time, when I go to Germany, I feel even more happiness. And it's not because something else is forcing me to feel that way. Uh, I feel like I'm, I feel better about myself. I feel more at peace. Um, and I know it's gonna sound like that I'm saying that Germany makes me happy. And maybe I need to sit and think and contemplate my life now. Maybe, you know, I'm not above making mistakes and feeling like I'm not allowing my situation now in the United States to be enough for me. And maybe that's some meditation that I need to do. Um, but I have uh, in recent years and, and months really sat down and thought, you know, I, I'm where I need to be at this moment. This is where I need to be right now. And in a year's time, five years time, 10 years time, I'm going to be somewhere where I need to be at that point in my life. I can't force it. I can't rush it. Timing is everything. And timing happens whether you want it to or not. There is a right time for everything. And if we're constantly chasing and pushing and, and trying to, to climb that mountain to get where we think we want to be. We're missing out on a lot of things that are happening right now, and it is very difficult. I understand, I, I, I'm in the same place a lot of times where it is very difficult to just appreciate what you have right now. And I do, I appreciate it so much. I appreciated the fact that last night my wife and I got to sit out in our backyard, have a little fire and have a beer. Um, and just talk. And I appreciate that. But we find ourselves too often dreaming of thinking we'd only be better if. Well, it's okay now. It's good now. And if you want it to be better, then you need to start working toward that. 
Do whatever it takes. Take, so, take those little steps. Take, take that first action. I want to learn German. It's not going to happen unless I make it happen, unless I do it. I can't just dream about one day being fluent in German and being able to speak with my wife's family. I have to want it to a point where I'm going to make the changes and do the work to make it happen. So please share your comments down below on what you thought of this video and anything that uh, has helped you become more at peace with yourself or where you are in life. I would love to hear them. I know other viewers would like to read that. So leave them down below. Thank you so much for watching this video. A link to the original will be down in the description. And if I can find some links to the couple books that they mentioned, I will also link those down in the description in case you like to read and you would like to learn more about that. But again, thank you. Thank you so much for watching. And until the next video, I'll catch you later. Bye.